Okay, we're recording. So I know there were some questions on the forum. Matt, I think it was you, right? Had a couple of questions. Yep, that's yes. correct. I can read them out for you if you like. Ah, uh, um, yeah, or you can express them in, <laughs> in yeah. your own terms, whatever. Yeah, yeah. tell me. Um, so I guess um, they weren't so much, first of all, there weren't a couple of, they weren't questions, they were just sort of differences when working on paper space, you were working on your local GPU. Mm. Um, and I found um, uh, symlinking the Kaggle folder into storage uh, with my API keys, something that I did to make it a little bit easier to restart. And mm. Just wanting to verify that that's sort of a good thing to do. Mm. Um, and um, but, but the, the the one thing that I would be really keen to know about is uh, the when I did the pip install of Tim, um, it was um, it was fine. It was installed, um, but I had to restart the kernel. And um, I'm wondering uh, that might be a bit of a pain going forward. I'd prefer to have it persistently uh, just there, ready to go. Yep, no but it's not a con not a conda package, so I wasn't sure how to uh, yeah. So Proceed. it's actually it's actually pip packages are the only ones we've actually got the persistence working for. So let's do that one first. So um, the the key thing when you install Tim, um, let's see, do I already have it installed? Uh, import Tim. Okay, great. I don't. So let's do it. Um, so the the key thing to remember is when you install Tim is to do it with dash dash user. Now. Um, uh, in order to make that easier, um, I think what I would be inclined to do would be to um, edit our slash storage slash dot bash dot local and um, add to it um, alias, uh, let's do pi for pip install equals pip install, um, let's do minus U for upgrade. I think that should work even if it's not installed already. Minus minus user. Okay. Now, if I uh, so I could close and reopen my um, terminal, or I could just type source and then the name of the script, which of course in this case is exclamation mark dollar. Um, whoopsie daisy. Um, exclamation mark vim will rerun this. This whole thing needs to be in quotes because it's a single thing that's my alias. Okay, up arrow twice. Okay, so now I can just type PI. Um, and by the way, if you wanna know um, what something is, um, if you type um, which PI, it won't tell you anything useful because it's an alias, not a binary. But if you type type pi, it will tell you exactly what it is. In this case, oh, it's something that's an alias. Hmm. So I can type pi Tim. And uh, the key thing about minus minus user is that's going to put it in my dash dash local directory. Sorry, my dot local directory. So there it is, Tim. So then all you need to make sure is that your local directory is symlinked to dot slash storage config local. Ah, now that's interesting. Our, um, this is here is telling us we've got a broken symlink. So oh, that's what that means. Yeah, dot get config is symlinked to slash storage. But there is no dot git config there. Um, so I might have maybe forgot to move that or something. Um, so that's okay. Next time we try to commit, it'll tell us and we'll know to fix that then. Um, to create a file that's empty, you just use touch. So I'm just going to go ahead and create an empty file. So at least it exists and then things won't get horribly confused. Is 
did I not touch it correctly? Uh, slash storage slash dot get config. Oh, there's a slash at the end. Oh, that's why. That's why it's confused. So um, that would be a directory, but this is not a directory. So my guess is that there's a bug in our pre-run script for dot dip config. Yes, I've got a slash at the end. So that's why that didn't work. So if I um, source that. Now it's happy. Great. Um, so now, yeah, so now um, since it's been installed into something that's symlink back to slash storage, Tim will be available. And if I run IPython, we can confirm it did install. That should be all good. Does that answer that part of the question, Matt? Yes, thank you. No and... worries. So then the second one, oh yeah, it was not a question, but a comment, which is about Kaggle. Um, so yeah, when I get back to using Kaggle on um, this machine, we will, we will do that for sure, which will probably cool. be next time. And uh, you also had a question about uh, jumping around to, um, you know, the end of a string, for example, um, uh, which, Uh, let's um, grab fast.ai's repo, for example. Oh, and you also had a question about loading and saving models. Great. So, I mean, um, one thing obviously is it'd be nice to have a tags file. Um, at some point we could even talk about how to set up Vim to automatically create that for us from time to time. Um, but let's have a look at, I don't know, layers, for example. Um, so a few things to mention. The first is something which sounds very obscure but actually isn't is um is uh f in vim um f in vim is like slash now slash searches so we've seen it before slash in it will search for the next thing called in it okay um oh maybe something we haven't discussed is to go back to where we were regardless of whether it was a tag or a search or anything um it's control o and right next to control o is the letter i which goes forward again. Okay, so control O and control I go kind of, it's like pressing the back button and the forward button on your browser. Um, there's something a lot like slash, um, but it just finds a single letter, which is F. If I type F, it's going to, and it's only a search on the current line, it'll search on this line for the next thing I type. So if I type F double quote, actually uh, maybe more interesting would be uh, F full stop. So if I type F full stop, it's going to jump to the full stop, F dot. So you see it jumps to the full stop, right? And so your question was, well, what about jumping to the end of a string? Now, in this case, the end of a string is the last character of the line. So there's a better answer, which is to start inserting at the end of the line. It's shift A. Uh, just one moment.
My daughter's got kicked off her Zoom call. Always technical problems. Okay, um, so I can undo that. Control O to go back to where I was. Um, but yeah, so uh, let's say there was some stuff at the end, hash some comment, right? And uh, we wanted to, yeah, we wanted to go to the next double quote. Um, I can just type F double quote and it takes me there. Um, and then shift F does the opposite, it searches backwards. And the reason it's interesting mainly is that that's a motion and therefore I can combine things with it. So for example, if I wanted to uh, delete everything up to the next quote, I can press D, F double quote, right? And then I could press slash double quote to search the next one and press dot and it'll do the same thing again, right? Or maybe delete everything up to the next comment would be D, F, hash. Um, so yeah, those are a couple of useful things. Another really useful one is um, percent. Percent uh, jumps to, be, to between the start and the end of a um, set of paired uh, parentheses or braces or brackets. So if I press percent here, it goes to the start. Uh, it goes to the start of end of the next parentheses, and then press it again. You can see it jumps between the two, right? And so if I do it from here. You can see it jumps to the end of this one, right? Uh, or if I do it at the very end, it'll jump to this one. Um, so if I want to delete from here to the end of the parenthesized parenthetical expression, like let's maybe say to delete this bit, I could press D F, um, sorry, D F percent. Uh, sorry, not D F percent, just D percent. There you go, D percent, you see? Mm. Um, although there's actually something even better for that, which is um, I. Um, and I is um, uh, refers to an area, the whole area that is um, surrounded by some kind of parentheses. So even when I'm in the middle of these this, these parentheses, the, the enclosing parentheses would go from here to here. And so I stands for inside. So if I want to delete everything inside those parentheses, I can type D I open round per, uh, hang on, do that again. Uh, D I open round parentheses, and it deletes the contents, which is really nice. Um, so let's say I wanted to like replace all my parameters um, with something else like A comma B. Um, then I would, I would use C for change uh, inside parentheses. I would type my change like A comma B, right? And then I can come down here and type dot, and it'll do the same thing. So yeah, it's like um, medial work. You can kind of really crush with these tricks. Great, it's fantastic. Yeah, it's cool. There's a lot of them and you don't have to know them all. You know, it's like you can learn one thing each day or something. And um, Yeah, I'm not using any plugins or anything. You know. Um. Um, okay, so we're going to save a model in a moment. Um, any other questions or comments before I go back to our notebook? I want to make one comment about the TIM installation. I don't know if maybe you discussed this yesterday because I came a little late, but with the TIM installation, I, I um, Sometimes it might be better to install from master because there are some changes that Ross has made that you might not receive if you yeah, just install it from. Yeah, we did mention the... that yesterday. Okay. And actually, I think the conclusion we came to was to install the latest pre-release um, because that's like something that's more stable than installing from master, but... Um, um, but you know, better than his. Sometimes, he, like here, he went six months without yeah. updating. Um, so yeah, I agree. In fact, so let's do that. Um, so this is zero point six point two dev. So I think we decided that we'd go. Let's use our new PI thing. Um, Tim is greater than or equal to zero point six point two dev. Great. Yeah, thanks for the reminder, Tanish. All right. Great. 
Um, it's it's kind of this um, thing in um, Python modules and quite a lot of other things. If there's like an extra dot dev at the end, that means it's a pre-release, basically. And so pip has this um, convention that if you say, um, I want to install something that is at least as recent as 0.6.2 dev, then that's a way of signaling to pip that you're, you're happy to include pre-release options. Um, is there any reason that when you uh, <clears throat> do the installation of, of, of a theme, um, and then you try to use the learner, it doesn't, it, it says that theme doesn't exist when you try to load the model. Right. That's because you have to um, restart the kernel after installing it. And so now that it's installed in .local, every time I start a machine, it's going to be there anyway. So you wouldn't have to worry about that again. OK. So um, this was our. Um, notebook from yesterday. Um, and um, I wanted to um, try and improve the model. And um, one of the reasons I wanted to try to improve the model is because um, we are, you know, our, our um, result was, you know, worse than the top 50%. There you go, top 56%. I didn't know that was a tip, that's handy. Um, and so we should, uh, you know, I, I want to aim to at least uh, be as good as this helpful fast AI, out of, fast AI out of the box person. So they got 0.97385. Um, how far off are we? You know, which is that's quite a me. bit better than ours, right? That, that was me. That was my, my number. Fantastic. I like it. It's a good notebook. So we're going to try to beat you. I hope you don't mind. But then you'll know how to beat us because, well, at least you know how to match us. So, by all um, um, so yeah, I, I, I saw that uh, what you did here was uh, you trained for longer, which makes sense. Um, and you also used some um, data augmentation, which makes sense. So Let's talk about um, about this. So, if we're going to train um, uh, for so, what was your name, Gerardo? Is it is it Gerardo or Gerardo? Uh, either way, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Which is right. I want to be accurate. Uh, well, my name is Gerardo in Spanish. Gerardo. Gerardo. I see. So both are right. No worries. Thank you, Gerardo. Okay. So if we're going to train uh, as long as Gerardo did, then um, you know if you train more than about five epochs, you're in danger of um, overfitting, um, and certainly ten. I feel like you're in significant danger of overfitting because your model's going to have seen every image, you know, ten times. So um, in order to avoid overfitting to the specific images it's seeing, we should make it so that it sees a slightly different image each time. And um, uh, this is discussed. Uh, in the book um, um, in some detail. Um, but uh, basically, if you pass in batch transforms, these are things that are going to be applied to each mini batch, so to each bunch of however many, 32 or 64 or whatever images. Um, and the, this is basically a bunch of functions that are going to be applied. So what does this function do, org transform? So this is transforms for data augmentation. So we know that the best way to find out what something's going to do is to check its help. So let's start there. Uh, not help, doc. OK, so um, it's going to do things like flip our images, rotate them, zoom them, change their brightness, their warp, um, see so show in docs. Um, okay, and here's some examples of a very cute puppy that Sylvia found. I think Sylvia found it. Um, so this is all the same puppy. It's all the same picture. And as you can see, each time the model sees it, it sees a somewhat skewed or rotated or 
brightened or darkened or whatever version of that picture. And so this is called data augmentation. Um, so um, let's try then running that. And so org transforms actually returns a list, right? It returns a list of transformations. So here's the flip transformation with a probability of 0 0.5, it'll flip. Uh, it's got a brightness transformation with a probability of one. It will change the lighting by up to 0 0.2. And then a random resized crop is perhaps the most interesting one, which is it will zoom in such that it has at least 75% of the um, height and width. And it will, um, yeah, it will basically pick a, a, a smaller zoomed in section randomly chosen each time. Um, so what we can do is when we say show batch, if you say unique equals true, it'll show the same picture each time. And so here you can see four versions of the same picture. And you can see sometimes it's flipped, sometimes it's moved a little bit up and down, sometimes it's a little bit darker or less dark and it's also a little bit rotated. Um, so that's what data augmentation is, and that really helps us if we want to train a few more epochs. Um, then the second thing I figured we should do is, um, you know, ResNet's actually great, um, but there are things which are um, greater, and as we talked about, Tim has a bunch of them, and in particular, ConvNext are pretty good. Um, and the other thing, you know, we could do is think about um, learning rates. The the default learning rate used by FastAI is one where I would say I picked it on the conservative side, which means it's a little bit lower than you probably need because I wanted things to always be able to train. Um, um, but there's actually a downside to using a, a couple of downsides to using a lower learning rate than you need. The first is that given fixed resources, fixed amount of time, um, you're going to have less epochs, um, not less epochs, sorry, less distance that the weights can move. The second is it turns out a high learning rate helps the, the, the optimizer to explore the space of options by jumping further um, to see if there's better places to go. Um, so the learning rate finder um, is suggesting things around about 0 0.002, which is indeed the, the default. Um, but you can see that all the way up to like 10 to the negative two, it still looks like a pretty nice slope. And the other thing to remember is, you know, as we saw after answering Nick's question yesterday, we're using one cycle training schedule, which means we're gradually increasing the learning rate. And my claim was that by doing that, we can reach higher learning rates. So I would also say that even these recommendations are going to be a bit on the conservative side. So what I did just before I started this call was I tried a training at a learning rate of 0 0.01, which is um, five times higher than the default. And so that's up here. And I did find actually that that did give us a quite a, a, a better result with a 2% error. So let's see, I mean, obviously we've got different training sets, but this is hopeful, right? That we're gonna get um, a, a better result than our target. And it's nice to have a target to aim for. Um, okay, so that's that was the next thing. So then it's, since this took, uh, you know, six minutes to train, it's probably a good idea to save it. Um, so there's a couple of different things we can save with. Um, one is, um, dot save and the other is dot export. Um, so learner dot export saves uh, the contents, that's uh, not very well written, self, <laughs> say it's of the learner, self means that this learner, um, and it saves it to self dot path slash f name, so learner dot path slash f name using pickle. Um, so basically what that means is if you if you call this learn.export, um, it's going to save it into 
learn.path. So let's find out learn.path is what? Train images. And so this is actually whatever we passed in um, here. Um, so if we want to save things somewhere else, there's we've got a couple of options. One is to change learn.path by setting it equal to some other path. Or we can just use an absolute uh, path. So an absolute path is something that starts with slash. And so uh, if I want to save it somewhere in storage, for example, um, then I can type slash storage slash whatever. Um, or maybe I want to put it in slash notebooks somewhere. Um, so these are, the, the, these are some ways you can um, change um, where it's going to save. Um, I might even just put it into the current directory. I think that seems fine to me. Um, well, actually, where are we? Current directory. Yeah, put it in git patty. That sounds fine. Or maybe to be a bit more sure, just in case the directory ever changes. Be more specific. Um, so then the other option is learn.save. So learn.save doesn't save the whole learner. It just saves the model and the optimizer state. The difference is that remember a learner doesn't just contain the model, but it also contains um, it also contains um, the information about the data loaders and specifically what transformations are applied. So um, I don't really often, if ever, use dot save. Um, the only reason I would use dot save is like if I was writing something to like, and we already have stuff this in, in fastai. Well, so let's give an example. In fastai, we have something that's that uh, a callback that can save the model at the end of each epoch, or each time it gets a better result than its previous best, or whatever. In those cases, we might use dot save because um, then so then you recreate a learner and you can dot load into the learner. Um, but yeah, for exporting something, I want to be able to just load that exact thing with all the same details next time. Dot uh, exports the way to go. So I'm going to call dot export. I'm going to use it's a conv next. It's small, and I did 12 epochs. Oh, and this needs to be an actual path. Normally we actually try to make these things do that for you, but this is less friendly than I would like. Sorry about that. There we go. Okay. So we should now be able to see it. There it is. Okay, and it looks like we need to give it a dot pickle or whatever. Um, by default, it'll uh, with uh, with org transforms, which uses uh, which uses random resize crop. It'll randomly pick a subset of the crop of the image of this up to this of this size or bigger. Um, and the validation set it will pick out um, uh, the center. Um, it'll you know as, as as all the width it can or all the height it can without changing the aspect ratio. If you say um, squish instead, um, it will grab the whole thing and change the aspect ratio to squish it into a square. Matt, you don't have to raise your hand. Just uh, talk to me, mate. What's up? <laughs> um, can you hear me? I can't hear you. Does that mean you can't hear me? I can hear. Oh, I can hear you, but uh, I, I don't think you can hear. You. you can't hear anybody. Mm. So you do need to raise your hand. Why can't I hear you? Um, but you guys can hear me. Okay. Yes. Um, yes, we can hear you, Jeremy. We can hear you. I see why. Okay, say something. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, I can. All right. Ah, Sorry. okay. All right, did you guys, were you guys saying anything <laughs> I was meant to be hearing? Did I miss anything? Um, yeah, why did you choose uh, 12 epochs? 
Oh, um, no particular reason. I just saw that this one was using um, um, 14 and I thought, um, I'll aim for something around there, but maybe just do a little bit less. Um, I guess I often do around 12-ish epochs. Like, it seems to, like, for um, for fine-tuning things, which are somewhat similar to the original, um, it often seems to get pretty close to, you know, getting all the information it can, uh, just as a rule of thumb. Um, and... Uh -huh. I have a Runs question. in a reasonable amount of time, too, I'd say. The, the, uh, my assumptions were that the, the number 460 is because of the size of the, the images were 460. And, and then another assumption was 224 because when you show the team uh, with the different, uh, the con next, and the image size was 224. That's the reason that I selected that. Is that okay? Is that a, is that a correct assumption? Well, they were 640 by 480. So actually, um, so we do this, uh, look it up in the book. Um, it's under the section called pre-sizing. And I think this is around what we always pre-size to. Um, so actually maybe 480 would have been better because then it wouldn't have had to change one of the dimensions because they were 640 by 480. Um, and then your size you picked, I actually changed it. So uh, Gerardo picked um, 230, but actually most of these models uh, that are trained on ImageNet are generally trained on 224. So I wanted them to be the same size as what they trained on. Um, so that's why I picked 224. Um, yeah, so then Squish I've talked about. Um, oh, and then the other thing is the model I picked is one with a suffix in 22K. Um, IN here refers to ImageNet, uh, and the 22K refers to the version of ImageNet with 22,000 categories, as opposed to the version that's normally used, which only has 1,000 categories. So this is a ConvNext, which is small, but is trained on ImageNet with a 22,000 category version. The 22,000 category version, it just has a lot more images covering a lot more different things. So there's a much higher chance that it's going to have seen something like um, rice paddy illness than the one with a thousand images, and it's just seen a lot more different pics, you know. Um, so, yeah, I would recommend always using the N22K pre trained models. Um, so, those are, uh, I think, the key differences at the training stage. Yeah, I think uh, when you had put the uh, the export and then the error came, that's when it cut off. So I don't think you explained the, what you did to, we well, didn't catch the part where you explained the fix. The fix. Well, because the export had an error, right? And then you had, I guess you've now added I don't the think path. It did have an, I don't think it had an error, but I just, oh, I see. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, yeah, the export yeah. had an error because this was a string and it actually needs to be a path. Um, yeah. which I'd say is an oversight on my part. I try to make it so that everything can accept a path or a string. So I would consider that a bug that ought to be fixed. So hopefully by the time people watch this video, that might've been fixed. But yes, at the moment, I had to change this to a path. Thank you. Um, all right, so there's a few things we could do here, right? But um, um, one 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 key issue is that the um, is that particularly if you don't have method equals squish, when we do validation, it's only selecting the center of the image, and that's a problem, right? Um, we would like it to see all the image. Um, and then another thing is that we've been training it with various different augmentations, um, but the uh, the validation set we don't use any of those augmentations. Um, so there's a trick you can use, which you should particularly use if you don't use Squish and it's effectively cropping into the center, which is something called um, test time augmentation. And in test time augmentation, we um, basically get um, um, multiple versions of each image. We actually, by default, get four different randomly augmented versions of each image. Um, and uh, plus the unaugmented version, we get the prediction on every one, and then we take their average. And that's called test time augmentation. Um, 
And as I said, it's going to it would work particularly well without the squish, um, but it ought to work well even with the squish. So to get those predictions, um, let's first of all make sure we can replicate this error rate manually, right? So if we go um, um, probabilities comma targets equals learn dot get preds. Um, and we pass in the validation set. Um, and then we should find that if we ask now for the error rate, shift tab, uh, so the inputs are the probabilities and the targets are the targets. There we go. Okay, so that's our 2.02% error rate. So we've, we've replicated that. Um, okay, so now we've got that 2.02. .02, um, I would then um, try out TTA. And of course, before we use a new function, we would always read its documentation. Uh, here we are, .tta. So return the predictions on some data set or some data loader. Um, we get the predictions n times by default four using the training set transformations. Um, Great. Oh, and instead of getting the average of predictions, we could also get the max of predictions. Um, cool. And, you know, the other thing which I definitely encourage you to do is, you know, it's always good to look at the um, source code because um, my claim is that fast AI functions are generally not very big. Um, and like also quite a bit of it stuff you can kind of skip over, right? This kind of like, oh, what, what if it's none? Or what if it's none? Like this is just setting defaults. You can kind of skip it. Try finalies, you can skip because it's just error handling. Um, widths, you can pretty much split. Progress bars, you can pretty much skip. Um, so the actual work starts happening here. So it calls self.getpreds, passes in a data loader and then it concatenates that all together and then it takes either the maximum or the mean depending on whether you asked for the uh, max or not and it also grabs it for the um, validation set data loader um, yeah so you kind of get the idea um, so let's run it, see if we can beat 2.02%. So you can see here it's running at four times for each of the four augmented versions. And then it will run at one time for the non-augmented version. Okay, and it beat it, but just by a little bit. Um, and then, you know, another thing is, well, what if we did um, the non-maximum? Use max equals false. Use max equals true. Use the maximum instead of the average. Yeah, I kind of wish I didn't have the squish in now, but I don't want you guys to have to wait 10 minutes for it to retrain, because then you'd much more clearly see the benefit of using TTA. That's interesting, that one's worse. So um, <clears throat> I generally find that when not using Squish, that using TTA and use max equals true is, is best. Um, okay, so now we've done all that, we can try and submit this one to Kaggle. Um, so we can just repeat basically what we had yesterday, but instead of get preds, We'll do TTA. Ah, now there's no width decoded, I don't think, for TTA. So we're going to have to do a bit of extra word work here. So this is going to give us the probabilities and the targets.
And so the probability is each row is going to contain a probability for each element of the vocab. So we can take a look. And so it's a so for each of the 3,469 things in the test set, there are 10 probabilities, which presumably means the length of the vocab is 10. Which it is. Um, great, so um, to find, so what we wanna do is find out, well, what's it actually predicting? And the thing it's predicting is whatever thing has the highest probability. So we're gonna go through each row and find the index of the thing with the highest probability. So in, in math and PyTorch, NumPy, that's called uh, argmax. So argmax is the index of the thing with the highest value. So um, probs dot argmax. And so what do we want to take the maximum over which dimension? Um, so we want to do it over rows, which I think we say dimension equals one. There we go. So that's the correct shape. So now we should be able to do the same thing we did yesterday, which is to convert that into a series. And now we should be able to run um, this mapping. Now I, I realize actually this thing we did yesterday where we went k colon v for k comma v in enumerate um, is actually a really long way of just saying create a dictionary from, from those from those tuples. So um when you create a dictionary, you can do it like this. Right? Um, or you could do this. Um, here's a here's a tuple of tuples. Um, okay, sorry, here's a tuple of tuples. And ideally what we'd like is to call dict and pass in each pair of these as an argument to it. And so Python actually has syntax to do exactly that for any function, not just dict, which is the function star star. And star star means take a mapping and pass it in as as pairs. Um, so that's what this does, right? Um, and that's going to be a mapping, um, which enumerate already is. Um, so that's what star star. Let's just pop this here. Why is this not working? I expected this to work. Hmm. How annoying. Well, so much for that discussion. Annoying. All right, I'm gonna to have to try to think of a better way to make this work. Because so far, similar problem to what we had yesterday. I think you don't need the star star in that case. Wow, that's nice, isn't it? Even better. Thanks for the trick. Okay. I didn't quite get to show you about how cool star star is, but never mind. Um, okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, make a copy of the last time we did ahead of the submission. And one reason I like to do that 
for my new submission is to confirm that our new one looks somewhat similar. So previously we went HISPA normal, downy, blast, blast. Now we go HISPA normal, blast, blast, blast. And so this makes me feel com comfortable that, okay, we haven't totally broken things. It's still giving largely the same results as before with a few changes. And so that's just something I like to do, okay. Um, And then another thing I like to do is kind of keep track of stuff I've done before. I try not to delete things I've used before so and just pop it into a different notebook or a comment. So down here, I'm just gonna have non-TTA version just in case I want that again later. All right, so we should be able to submit that now. Okay, so I used control R and then started typing competitions. Okay, so this is uh, now a squish conv next small 12 epoch fine tune TTA. Uh, what on earth did it do to my window? How do I get it back? Oh, it, oh, I see, I've got two, how did that happen? I've got two desktops going. I didn't notice that. Um, all right, let's go and check out Kaggle. submissions. Oh, look at that. Harada is still beating us, I think, but at least we've beaten our previous one. <laughs> That's amazing. That's great. Jump to our leadable position. We're going to have a, a good battle on 34. No, you, you, I think you beat me up. I'm, I'm, Wait, I I'm, thought yours was better than that. I'm I think sorry. I'm a little bit lower. Um, code. Oh, you are 97385. Okay, 979. Ah, oh, okay. That's not bad, right? Actually, 34th out of... I mean, it's just a fun competition. Nobody's really trying too hard, but still, you know, it's nice to feel like you're in the mix. How far are we? Okay, so um, this person's still way ahead, right? Um, they've got an error of 1.3% and we've got an error of 2.1%. Um, you know, something else that would be fun would be, um, you know, you could like you can kind of super easily create an ensemble. So maybe I'll show you how I would go about creating an ensemble. Um, to create an ensemble, I would be inclined to um, maybe um, we could create an ensemble with uh, a, an unsquished version, for instance. Um, so what I would do is I'd kind of like copy all the stuff that we used to get our predictions, right? And then I would kind of paste them down here, uh, go through and remove the stuff that isn't quite needed, like so. Um, this one's gonna be no squish. And we'll do max is max equals true. 
Um, and so then to merge cells, it's shift M, M for merge. And don't need the error rate anymore. Um, and so this is going to be a second set of probabilities and a second set of targets. Um, yeah, so we could just run that um, and um, take the average of these two models. Oh, I'll remove squish here. Okay, so that might be our third model. Um, and then another model I would be inclined to try is one that doesn't use square. Um, so we've got 640 by 480 images, right? So the aspect ratio is four to three. Um, so I would be inclined to say, take that and multiply that by the smaller side we want. Okay, that gives us 298.66. Um, be nice to find something that works a bit more evenly, wouldn't it? What if we did it the other way around? So we could create 168 by 224 images, for instance, or Three three six maybe. Three three six by two five two images. Yeah, let's do that. So let's change this size. Um, and I never quite remember which way around it is, but that's okay. We'll check it. So um, three three six by 252 images. And so the reason I'm doing um, rectangular, uh, sorry, rectangular images is that, um, yeah, all of our input images are the same aspect ratio. So there's no particular reason to make them square. You know, when some of your images are wider than tall and some are taller than wide, then it makes perfect sense to, you know, use square as your, you know, the thing that everything gets changed to. But there's, you know, when everything's wider than they are tall, and especially, especially when they're all the same aspect ratio, it makes more sense to keep them at that same aspect ratio. Um, and, you know, another thing I guess we should consider doing for 640 by 380 is to, you know, you can um, change their resolution more gracefully without weird interpolating fuzziness. Um, by doing it by you know a, a factor of two, so we could do three twenty instead of six forty, um, and by two forty. So that would be another one I'd be inclined to try. Yeah, in fact, let's just do that. Let's make that the aspect ratio. There we go. Um, and so obviously we should check it, and we know how to check it, which is to go show batch. Okay, so you can see I've got it the wrong way around. There we go, that's better. Um, cool. Oops. And like given that um, we're going to have such nice clear images, I would probably do the um, the affine transforms are the ones where we're zooming and rotating and stuff. Um, so to say don't do those so often, we can change the probability of affine transforms from 0.75 to 0.5. Probability of affine transforms to 0 0.5. Um, so in theory, I feel like this one feels the most correct, given that the data that we have is a fixed input size of that type. So 
I would be inclined to, um, well, you know, we'll take a look afterwards, um, but Did I just do? Copy. We'll save a different set. And so we can easily then check the accuracy of each of them. And this one's going to be rectangular. Rectangular. There we go. Now that we're saving a few, I guess I'm a little worried that um, paper space might disappear. And so I'm actually inclined to save these into my notebooks directory, just to be a bit paranoid. Copy, paste. And so um, let's move. Um, let's move this one into slash notebox. Oh, that's right. I'm not using paper space, so I don't have to. Ha ha ha! I forgot. <laughs> Never mind. I'm on my own machine. That's. I, I like the fact that I've got um, paper space so well set up now that I don't even remember I'm using paper space. Okay. Um, great. I think that's that. All right, I'm going to not have you guys watch that run for 20 minutes, so I'm going to go. Um, any questions or comments before we wrap up? So I see um, that you're like focusing yeah. a lot on like the data transformations and augmentations. When would you focus on that versus, you know, playing around with different models and things like that instead? Um, <clears throat> um, given that this is a image classification task for natural length for natural photos, um, it will almost certainly have exactly the same characteristics as ImageNet in terms of accuracy, uh, or at least fi any fine tuning on ImageNet. Um, so I would, I'm working on the assumption, which I could, you know, we can test later, but I'm pretty sure it's going to be true that, um, the things that are in that, um, that notebook showing which, which Tim models are better than others will apply to this data set. So, um, I would, um, once everything else is working really well, you know, I would then try it on a couple of models or at least run it on a bigger one like base or large or whatever I can get away with. Um, if it was like a segmentation problem or an object detection problem or a medical imaging data set, which has the kind of pictures that aren't in ImageNet, you know, for all of these things, I would try more different um, architectures. But then for those cases, I would, um, let's say it was a segmentation problem, which is about recognizing what each pixel is, you know, is, is is a pixel of. Um, even there, I would not try to replicate the research of others. Instead, I would go and look at um, something like paperswithcode.com to find out which techniques have the best results on segmentation. And better still, I would go and find two or three previous Kaggle competitions that have a similar problem type and see who won and see what they did. Um, now, when you look at who won, they always say, oh, we, we made an ensemble which is fine, the, but the in, important thing isn't that they did an ensemble, it'll be, they'll always say pretty much the best model in our ensemble was X. And so I would just use X. And I would use this kind of like smallest version of X I can get away with. Um, and yeah, generally fiddling with architectures tends not to be very useful nowadays for any kind of problem that like people have fairly regularly studied, um, which, almost any computer vision problem is of that type. Um, I guess the only interesting question for this one would be, uh, there is something saying what kind of rice is in this patty, um, which is like a, cat a, a category, um, but I'm 
fairly sure that using that information is not going to be helpful in this case because the model can perfectly well see what kind of rice it is. So I don't very much doubt we have to tell it because it's got pictures. Uh, Jeremy, yeah, it's it's uh, it's going to take me a while to work my way through all of the videos. Yeah, are they going to be uh, perpetually available? Yes. Cool. Thank yes, you. and don't feel like you can only join if you've watched all the previous videos and don't feel like you can only ask a question if you've watched all the previous videos like it's totally fine to ask a question about a video we did a week ago um, or about something that we just covered yesterday or whatever if the answer to your question is oh we cover this in this video here's where you go i will tell you that and that's totally fine but uh, and and if it's like okay, you said this thing in this other video, but I don't get it, say it again. That's totally fine too. Like we're moving at quite a fast pace because people can go back and rewatch the videos and because people can come back later and ask questions about things that aren't clear. Um, so yeah, it definitely does rely on people turning up and saying, um, <laughs> I'm not clear on this or, or whatever. Yeah, well, I sort of started from ground zero in this whole environment, but mm. uh, it's starting to make sense now. I'm starting oh, to feel a little, little bit more comfy with it. Nice. Well, and uh, I just want to take the time to work through my way through and uh, yeah. absorb, absorb what you've been talking about. Well, also, Daniel, I will say, like, there's a couple more um, lesson lessons to come. Um, like, yeah. in, what is it, next week or the week after? I suspect during those two weeks, I'll probably stop the walkthroughs. So yeah, sure. um, there'll be a couple of weeks there to catch up. But yeah, like feel free to um, yeah, join in any time or not join in any time and ask questions about any yeah. video or even about things that's not covered in a video, but you feel like would be something useful to know in order to understand. Okay. Something done. I'm really looking forward to the tabular data, actually. Oh, cool. Yep. Okay. okay, thank you. Thanks all. See you next time. Bye. Bye. Thank you.